Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this video I want to show you guys the steps to set up top-down 2D style combat for a Unity game using the Unity 2022 editor. So this is sort of a follow-up to a Crash Course video that I published on my channel about a month ago. So I'll have the link to that video below if you want to catch up on things like how to use the tile map, how to make your character move in a basic fashion, and setting up a camera. So as you can see in the test scene, we already have a player character. There's already a camera. There's already tile maps. I can show you using the animation window uh, that I added in the animations for the character. So the only one showing right now is idle. We'll show how to switch to the run state again. And then I'll show you how to add in attack and die states. We'll add in a slime character and make the slime try to attack the player. And when you swing the character's sword, you'll be able to damage the slime, of course. So the art pack I'm using for this video, if you don't already know, is Mystic Wards on itch.io. It's by Game Endeavor. So definitely go ahead and check that out if you haven't already. As far as the character goes, you can see we have a sprite renderer. I'm also controlling the flip X so that we only have to have one right animation, but we can flip to the left like this when our character is actually moving to the left. The player controller script, I'll show that in a moment. Using the updated input system for player input that you get from the package manager. Uh, we have a rigid body 2D set to dynamic. Note that rotation is frozen here so that if any forces act on the object, it's not just going to rotate the sprite. That would be kind of silly for this top down style. Gravity scale set to zero, and then the collider on the character is just this little tiny circle collider. Of course, the collisions that exist on this tile map are being generated from a tile map collider. So the tiles you don't want to cause a collision are just on a different tile map that doesn't have that collider. And just to show the starting place for the player script here before we get started with the content of the video, taking the input value from the movement system, that's the player input component here, the vector for x, y movement, and we're using that in order to move the rigid body. So the rigid body is set to dynamic mode. We just modify the velocity, and I have it capped to a max speed. So no matter which direction the character is moving, we clamp the magnitude, which in this case is going to be the speed at which you're moving, not the direction, but just the speed, making sure that the sprite renderer shows if it's facing right or facing left. When there's no movement, we slow the velocity down using a linear interpolation function. So I have this idle friction variable up at the top. And setting the animator parameters, uh, this is going to be so that we can detect if the character is moving on the animator side of things, and then we can switch into a run state or an idle state based on if we're moving or not, which is what we're going to do next. So now that the basics of the scene have been set up, let's go ahead and talk about switching to the run state. So naturally, if I look into the folder where I have the player prefab, you can see I set up these animations. Each animation is just different frames from the sprite sheet. So if I was to look at animation run here, and let's expand this, move it out a bit, and zoom in. Well, it looks kind of tiny up there, but you can kind of see that these are individual frames of the sprite. So that's just looping, and that's how we would get a run animation, like you can see on the screen right there. So if we open up the animator window, which if you don't know how to do that is Windows Animation Animator, and you can open animation here as well. We need to make a connection between player idle and player run. You can see I've already created the float parameters, move X, move Y. You can see I've already created the float parameters, move X and move Y, which once again, those are being set here, update animated parameters, update animated parameters based on the movement input that we get from the movement system. And I'm only changing those values for now uh, when the movement input is not zero. But now that I think about it, I will just pull this outside of there. We'll have it run on every fixed update for now. And uh, until there's a reason not to change those values in the animator parameter. Okay, so in the animator, you can see we have move X, move Y parameters set up. Usually I would use these for blend states in a character. So if a character needs to have idle in four directions, then you can use the move X, move Y to move it towards the correct animation. But for this specific character, because there's only one animation, regardless of which way it's moving, we don't actually need these. I'm going to remove them. And inside of here, I'm going to move this update animator parameters down here. And what we're going to do instead is just to animator dot set boolean is moving and then we'll set that to is moving and then we'll have to create that variable up at the top 
as something to keep track of. So bool is moving, and that'll be set to false initially, since when the game starts, you should just be in the idle. So setting the move x, move y input values on your animator is helpful if you're going to do forward direction animation for your character. But this specific character actually only has one animation uh, regardless of its movement. So you can flip it to show left, but up and down is not a separate uh, animation to play. So there's actually no need for this specific character to have update animator parameters. If you are going to use a character that is going to use blend trees, you would want to set move X, move Y, uh, so that you can use that inside of the blend tree. But I'm going to remove that for now. It's actually unnecessary for this character. So uh, what we're going to do instead is have a is moving variable and we'll set is moving equals true and here to true. Uh, when the movement input is not zero. And then in here, uh, even if the velocity is not technically zero, we'll set is moving to false uh, because there's no input. So the way to think of the animator parameters isn't whether it's technically moving or not, it's whether you want it to show a specific animation. So I'll go up here to the top and I'll create a variable is moving. And I'll set that to false by default since when the game starts, our character is going to be idling. But let's also create a property up here. So this is going to be is moving, uh, capitalizing the first letter. And we're going to need a setter function. So in the setter function, I also want to set the animator parameter. This way, uh, we can just set is moving equals to true or false, and it will update the animator automatically. So is moving lowercase on the i equals the value that gets passed into the setter. But then we'll do animator dot set boolean is moving. And uh, we can also set that to the value. So I'll just do is moving here, since uh, the value should already be updated at this point. And now all we need to do is when we want to set this, we just use the property instead of the variable directly. So I'm going to go down here is moving equals true. And remember that updates the parameter automatically. And then down here is moving equals false. This is just one option of doing things uh, just to kind of save a step so that whenever we change this value, updating it on the parameter automatically. OK, so now we need to make sure that on the parameters list for the animator that we actually have is moving. So I'm going to do a new Boolean is moving. And notice I already removed the move X and the move Y parameters because I'm not doing blend states on this character, so it's not needed. OK. So now is moving is a boolean that we can use to transition between idle and run. So this will be pretty straightforward. Uh, take your idle state, right click on it, make a transition to run, right click on the run, make a transition to idle. When is moving is set to true, then we will just jump to run. So I'll do plus and you can see it automatically selects that is moving parameter. When it's set to true, we can switch to run and then vice versa. We add the parameter make it false is moving equals false means we transition into idle uh, next because the, next because these are pixel art characters next because these are pixel art characters and we want the switch to be instantaneous I'm going to uncheck has exit time and I'm going to make transition duration zero do that for both the do that for both transitions here so zero doesn't have an exit time which just means that uh, no matter what the timing is of the currently playing animation it can just switch immediately Okay, so now we can go ahead and hit play, and it's already going to work for that run animation. So you just need to make sure that your run animation is created, set up, and yeah, that'll basically be how you switch between idle and run. And once again, you can see that when the character runs up, it's just using the sideways run, which is fine. It definitely works for this kind of game, and uh, that way you only need to animate once rather than all four directions or three directions up, down, and right, and then flip the right to the left. So it's a pretty good time-saving trick. Uh, next, we need to go to player attack. So how we will do that is with a trigger, which is kind of similar to a Boolean, except that the trigger is a one time thing rather than a switch. So whenever we press the fire button on the player input, we're going to set that trigger. So with the new input system for Unity, which is in the package manager, Windows package manager, and then if you do Unity registry, you can just type input system here, if you want to add this to your own project, totally overrides the default Unity input with the new system. So just be aware of that, that uh, if you have code, you might need to rewrite some of it. 
Um, but anyway, by default, with the import actions asset, the one you create, it's going to have a fire option here. So fire, you can see it's a action button. And the button we are going to be pressing down is a left mouse by default, but you can easily add in another key here if you want. So we could just make, let's say, right control a fire button. So I will hit add. Let's add a binding. And this will be, let's see, if we click on path keyboard, and then we can just put listen, and I'll hit the right control. So that will already give us the right control keyboard, or you can just do control in general, uh, so that it doesn't specifically have to be right control, but I'll choose right control here. So that's just adding in a extra way to trigger the fire message to be sent to our game object, which is something we can respond to in our script. So let's go ahead and exit out of this and save so that the changes update. Let's edit our script. And we're just going to have to respond to the on fire message, which means we need to do void on fire doesn't have any parameters. And so when the player is pressing the attack button, of course, we want to attack. So with the animator, I'm going to set a trigger, which once again, is going to be consumed immediately. Every time you want to attack, you have to set the trigger again. So one button press equals one sword swing or whatever you need. So I'll be specific here. Let's do sword attack. You might set up uh, multiple attack keys, maybe one for a bow, one for a sword, something like that. So I just I'll call it sword attack to be very specific. And let's go back into the engine. Let's add the trigger. Make sure it has the same name sword attack. And we can right click on idle, make a transition to player attack. And this time, actually, we will have an exit time, it's going to be 1.0. So at the very end of player attack, we'll have a transition duration of zero. So this means it's going to actually play the full animation before it returns to player idle. In other words, once we commit to an attack, we're stuck playing that animation, at least as things are right now. So basically the same setup for player run, uh, the transition to enter can be any time with no transition duration. So uncheck exit time and player attack to go back to here. We do want an exit time, but no transition duration. So exit time one, no transition durations. And lastly, for the condition, add condition and do sword attack. Note, there's no true or false here. It just when the trigger is set, we can see if we can switch to that player attack. And over here, let's add in the sword attack once again. So, um, Player attack to player idle, player idle to player attack, player attack to player run, and a sword attack to player attack. Now, uh, for the return, we should also check is moving. So is moving equals true, then we return to player run. If uh, is moving is false, then we'll add in is moving false, we return to idle. Okay, so let's hit play and see if that works at all. I'm going to left click. Okay, we got our sword swing. Can also hit control on the keyboard for that, which is the key we added. Now, uh, the player can still move while we're in this state, which is working as written. So as things are right now, the player can still move while swinging the sword, which you might actually prefer. That would make the character very mobile, uh, being able to attack while moving. Uh, but animation wise, maybe it looks a little weird. So if you want to turn that off and make it so the player cannot move when it is attacking, then we'll need to set up some kind of lock in the script when the player attack animation starts and when it ends. So let's go back into the script and we could just make this a reusable function that we can use for any animation where we want to lock the character. And I'll just do void lock movement. And then we will need another Boolean to keep track of this. So can move equals false. And we'll do void unlock movement can move equals true. So we'll create this Boolean up here, just like before. Boolean can move equals true, since uh, when we load the game, it should be idling, and we would want the player to be able to move. So where this value is going to limit things will be in our update. So before we actually move, we want to see if we can move. So I'll do can move equals so do can move two equal signs to compare it to true. So just making sure that the character can move. And we're also checking that the movement input is not zero. And if that's the case, then we'll try to move. We'll flip the sprite renderer and so on. 
Otherwise, we're just going to go here. We're going to lower the velocity down to zero and uh, return to an idling animation. So uh, with this lock movement and unlock movement, we can run these functions when the animation is playing. So if we uh, go back to the animation window, let's uh, click on the character. I'm going to open up the player attack animation, and we're going to add in a animation event. So you can do that with this button right here uh, on frame zero. Okay, I'm going to move this animation window down here so we can see the inspector at the same time. Uh, so we add in that little tab there, the animation event, and now we can select a function to trigger at that event. So at the start of our attack animation, we want to come down here and find lock movement. Oh, it's actually up at the top, sorry. Um, and then when the animation is done at the very end here, 0.5 seconds later, I'm going to add the animation event and we're going to do unlock movement. Okay, so let's hit play and I'm going to attack. Okay, and now you can see when we are swinging the sword, the character cannot move. So that's two very different styles of movement. And if you're doing an action RPG, whether you can allow your player to move or not is going to have a huge impact on how the game plays, of course. But totally up to you which route you want to go for. And of course, if you feel like this amount of lock is too unfair to the player, you can always make your animation play faster, or you could unlock the movement on the last frame or lock it sometime after the animation starts, but not necessarily at the first frame. Uh, but this will do good for right now. Next, let's set up our slime enemy. So I'm going to right click in the scene. We're going to go down to 2D object sprites square. Uh, just as the starting game object for our slime, I will just rename it slime. And in the characters folder, I'm going to drag this into here as a prefab. Let's click here to open the prefab asset. And let's take the art from the pack. So sprites, characters, and then we have our slime. So the sprite sheets, I've already split them up. Let's go ahead and grab slime zero to use as the default frame here. Okay, and now we need to figure out which components we need for the slime. So add component, we'll want a rigid body 2D, and we're going to have it set to dynamic mode. By having your rigid body set to dynamic mode, you'll be able to have forces on the player acting on the slime and the slime acting on the player. Basically, when the slime runs into the player, you can knock back the player, or when the player swings a sword, you can do a knockback on the slime, which is kind of a cool extra effect on top of just subtracting health. So uh, let's turn the gravity scale to zero. There shouldn't be any gravity. Freeze the rotation on our slime so the sprite won't rotate. And uh, we'll need a collider to go with that. A slime is a mostly circular shape, so I think that works good for a collider. And let's edit the size of it. Just click Edit Collider right there. Shrink it down to what you think would be a good collision shape for the slime. Kind of like that is probably decent. Next, we got to set up those animations. So I'm going to add a animator component. Let's create a new runtime controller to control the slimes animations and switching the state. So in the slime folder, I'm going to right click in here, create animator controller, I'm going to call it AC for animator controller, underscore slime, click on the slime, drag in the animator controller. And now let's create the animations for the slime. So animation with slime selected over here, let's create slime underscore idle. I like to name all the animations, the character that's going to use it, and then the actual name of the animation. That way, if you're searching slime, you can see all of the slime animations one after another, if you just happen to have them in the same. Okay, so I'm just going to create this in the slime folder. And well, I guess we can bring this animation window to the top right. And let's go find the frames for slime idle. So I'm going to expand it here. I'm just going to kind of trial and error to figure out which frames are the idle animation, but looking at the sprite sheet, it kind of looks like it's the first four. So I'm going to select these four and I'm going to drag them into the animation window. You'll see the uh, sprite property changing the sprite that's displaying is already going to be updated here. I'm going to take the samples down to 10, which means 10 frames per second is how fast it's going to play. Uh, usually pixel art would be something like 10 or 20. So let's hit play and test that idle animation seems to be working correctly. And I'm going to look at the inspector for this sprite sheet. It kind of looks like all of these frames might be for the, I don't know if this is two separate jumps or just one. So it looks kind of like all of these frames are for one jump cycle animation. So I'll try to select all those. Let's see. So that's six and then seven more. So 13 frames. 
starting at slime zero. Let's go ahead and try that. So I'll do, uh, we could call it run or hop. I'll just try to be consistent and call it slime run, even though it's technically hopping. I think that's fine. So let's grab the frames here. I think it goes up to here. Let's add them in, change the samples to 10 for 10 frames per second, hit play and see how it's looping. Okay, nice. I think that's correct. And let's see. So after that, we can select these frames. So these three look like a slime hit animation. And I believe this is, of course, the slime death animation. So let's create those. So create clip slime underscore hit. And that's going to be these three frames. Drag them in there. 10. Now I'm going to hit play. This won't actually loop when uh, you play a hit animation. You would just do it one time as a trigger. So we'll change the hit animation so it doesn't loop in a second here. And let's also create the slime death. And we'll grab these five frames, drop them in there, set it to 10 samples. And there's our death animation. So click on the slime folder and let's take the hit animation. Go to the inspector where it says loop time, turn off loop. And same for the slime death. We only want those to play once. And while we're at it, I'll just double check player attack, make sure that it's not looping. Player die, not looping. Player idle and run are loopable, of course. Okay, uh, next, let's open the animator. We'll see the animations in here for our slime. So I'll just kind of organize these a little bit. And our setup will be really similar uh, for the slime as it was to the player. So I'm going to right click on slime idle connect that to slime run, slime run to slime idle. And let's add in a Boolean parameter here. I'll just do is moving again. However, we want to determine if it's moving or not in the script is fine, as long as this gets set. So let's turn off the exit time for the transitions and the transition duration set to zero. Okay, so turn off, set it to zero. Uh, next for getting slime hit, we need a trigger. So I'm going to connect this to slime hit and slime hit to idle, slime hit to idle and run to hit. So for the return, we're of course going to turn off the exit time and the transition duration. I'll add the condition. So it has to be moving for it to go to run. And then here is moving is set to false to return to idle. And we turn off the idle time and the transition duration. Now, uh, for this slime death, I think how I want this to go is after the slime hit is finished and the health of the slime is zero, we'll have a trigger, uh, which would be like slime die or something, and we'll transition into this animation. So this will only happen after the slime hit is played uh, for the final time after the health of the character goes to zero. So I'll add a trigger here. This will be death trigger. And here we'll have exit time of one, but no transition duration. So the slime hit animation has to play. Then we play slime death. And down here for condition, add this in death. Okay. Otherwise, it'll go back to these. And uh, we'll see how that works. Lastly, we need another trigger for hit. So if hit in either of these states, we'll add the condition hit, which makes us play the hit animation. And here we'll do hit as well. And uh, remember for the transitions into slime hit to turn off exit time and the transition duration as well, because those can happen anytime while the slime is moving. And if I have that all set up correctly, then that probably is all we have to do for the animator. Uh, we'll just need to set the script where we update these variables at the right time. So if we hit play, we can see the slimes idling there. Uh, because they're both dynamic rigid bodies, they can bump into each other like so. Um, definitely we'll have to tweak the physics a bit there. So if I open up the slime, let's see, rigid body. Actually, and yeah, now that I think about it, the linear drag here, you can just actually have this value set to something if you want there to be friction on the ground. Rather than hard coding it like I did right here, you can just change this value to what you need it to be. 
So, I guess that was kind of unnecessary on my part. Let's try a linear drag of one and see what happens. So, I'll hit play. We we'll bump into the slime. And it does stop eventually, but not that fast. So, let's just bump that up to 100. Hit play. Okay, and now you can see the slime is definitely a lot more resilient to getting pushed around. Maybe a little too much. So, I'll try 50. Hit play. Just bump into it. Okay, uh, that's good enough for now. Let's also try that on the player. So I'll make a linear drag of 50. And let's apply that to the prefab. Uh, that just means that it will update all instances of the player. And then we can comment this out, actually. So next, for the combat part of this tutorial, making the sword swing actually do something. So if we look at this, there should be a hitbox where the player can interact with the slime and the slime would take damage. So for that to actually work, let's create a hitbox area that is going to be adjacent to the player. So when we swing left, there'll be a hitbox we'll check with over here. And when we swing to the right, we'll check over here for the hitbox. So I'm going to add a child game object to the player, which we'll be able to manipulate by changing its uh, position offset from the player. Uh, but separately from the player, it's got its own transform component uh, so that we can use the same hitbox for facing the left and facing the right. So let's right click on the player, create empty, and I'll call this sword hitbox. Let's add a component here, and this will be a box collider as a trigger, which means it doesn't do anything physics. It's only checking to see if there is a valid target inside of the hitbox so we can do damage to it. First, let's start by adjusting the transform of the sword hitbox, not the collider itself. Maybe one unit and down a bit as well. So just offsetting it. Now let's shrink it. So I'm going to hit Edit Collider. And let's bring it to uh, wherever you think would be about the right distance for the player to hit. Uh, one thing you could do is uh, click on Player. And let's temporarily swap the sprite frame to be the sword swing at its furthest reach. So let's expand that. Here, that's the frame we want to look at. So I'm going to drag this into Sprite. Now we can click on the hitbox and see where it should be hitting. So I'll click Edit. So let's adjust this. I'm going to move it lower on the Y. And this will be the default shape and position of the hitbox. So we want this to be disabled any time that the player is not swinging his sword. So let's click on Player. So I think the component we want to disable temporarily is going to be the Box Collider. Um, don't want to disable the entire game object. It's only this box collider that's going to be checking for the collisions. So if we go to player now and let's open up animation, let's go to player attack. We're going to add property from the hitbox box collider, and we want the box collider to be enabled during the attack. So you can see that on the first two frames, there's no sword. This is when the sword comes out. So if you take the box collider over to here, the enabled, and then we check it, that'll make the box collider enabled. And then let's go further. Okay, let's actually play the animation. Okay, and you know, it might actually just be on that one frame where in that instant we want to be able to do damage. So let's add another keyframe over here, uh, click it, and then turn it off. So here it's enabled, here it's off. And for every other frame, it's going to be off as well. Just in case, we can uh, copy the box collider off keyframe to the start here, just ensuring that at the start of a sword swing that it is, in fact, off. So only here it's going to turn on and then it'll be off again. Okay, so that is what we need to do to make sure that the collider is valid. Uh, next, we need to set up the physics and check for a collision on that box collider. So in the script, let's get that sword hitbox game object. So I think a good way to make sure that we're referencing the exact game object is actually to make a public variable for a game object. So public game object, and we'll call this sword hitbox. And rather than searching for it with something like bit component, what we'll do is click on the player prefab. We'll find our script and then sword hitbox, the game object, we'll just drag it in there. So this is going to be setting it definitively to this exact game object. So if for some reason we ever lose a reference, then we could just make sure that it goes in there. 
for the collider on the sword, uh, we could get reference to that using get component. So if this is already set in the inspector, then we can just get a collider 2D from that game object. So I'll call this sword collider. Now, no, I'm not putting box collider 2D. So if we ever wanted to change what kind of collider it would be, uh, we wouldn't need to change the script here. This would just work for any types of collider. As long as all we need to do is check that there is a collision inside of the collider, which I think works here. So we'll do sword collider equals sword hitbox dot get component. And that is going to be collider 2D, uh, which should be able to pick up the box collider 2D type because that just extends from a collider 2D. Okay, and now that we have those two in script, we can control things from. Okay, so for controlling the sword hitbox from script, we could add the uh, game object and the components inside of the player controller script, but it might actually be better to create a separate script for the sword hitbox so that it can handle sending out the messages to whatever the sword hits that they need to take damage and the player itself doesn't really need to worry about it. So rather than stuffing everything up here, the sword will be more of its own thing. So let's add a component here and uh, I'll just call it, I guess we'll just call it sword hitbox and make it a new script. Let's add that. For now, I'll still drag this into the player character folder since the sword is associated with the player. And now let's go ahead and edit the script. So inside of the sword hitbox, I'm going to get reference to the Collider 2D. You can just call it Sword Collider. On start, we'll get the Sword Collider component. So even though it's a box collider, uh, because box collider inherits from Collider 2D, uh, this will actually get the box collider from the list of components as well. So what we're going to want to do now is whenever a game object enters the active Sword Collider, basically gets hit by the sword, we want a triggering event to occur. So in our model behavior script, we can do void on trigger enter 2D, which is going to which is going to have the collider 2D shape from the game object that walked into the sword. So we could just do collider 2D collider here. And uh, what we we'll want to do is send a message to the game object of the collider to take damage. So if we send it to the game object, any script on that game object that will respond to this message uh, can take the damage that we assign to it from the sword. So if we do collider dot send message, okay, and we'll do on hit. So, so we'll just be consistent in our game whenever a character gets hit, uh, we'll do the on hit message. So we'll be sending a damage amount and I might call this sword damage to be specific. Okay, so when it enters, we tell the colliding object to get hit for a certain amount of damage. And up here, we can do a public float sword damage. And I'll just set this to one for now. Of course, you can increase that. Uh, really, the number is arbitrary. Uh, we'll just be subtracting that from the health of the slime. So continuing with the sword hitbox script, it actually seems the get component on a collider will not automatically pick up the box collider 2D. So we can still assign the box collider 2D as a sword collider. One way would be to make this public and then and then drag and drop the box collider in the inspector. Another way would be to type box collider 2D in here and then it would take the box collider and assign it as the collider 2D. Just in case we ever actually change what type of collider we're using for the sword hitbox, maybe you'd use a circle collider. I'm going to just make it public. I think that makes more sense here. So then we just need to drag the box collider into this collider 2D spot. And then you can right click it and apply it to the prefab so that this is the default collider for this script. This is the added benefit of being able to specifically specify the exact collider on the game object that you mean to use. Sometimes it's possible to have multiple colliders and you would want to make sure that the right one is selected rather than just using get component collider 2D, which might grab the first one in the list and not the actual one you wanted to use. So that's about it for the limitations of this bit right here. And because we are manually assigning it, we can just do a if and because we no longer need the 
and because we no longer need to make and because we no longer need the start script to find this word collider we could just put a little bit in here to check that it is not null when the script starts and we can log if it has not been set actually it might make sense to make that a log warning because that's a actual because that is potentially an actual problem there so next let's make sure that our sword swings are actually connecting with the slime there i'm going to take I'm going to take the game mode out of being maximized. So let's make it into play mode normally. And that way we'll be able to see the console down here when our sword connects with the slime. So when the sword connects with the slime, let's make it respond to this on hit message. So our slime is going to need a script for that. Let's create our slime enemy script. So I'll add a component. I'll type script for a new script and let's give it the slime script, create and add and we'll edit the script up. So we want to make that function void on hit. And then we will do debug.log and I'll type slime hit. So this will be a good indication of if everything is working with the sword. We can also add in this parameter. So in the on hit, I'll do float damage. And then we can put plus damage amount and slime hit for damage. So now we actually have both the slime getting hit and the damage amount, making sure that that comes through correctly. Also right click on this added component and apply it to the prefab. Let's hit play, swing at the slime, nothing happens. And we can see that when we're at frame two of the player attack, that the sword hitbox should be enabled. So if I check the hitbox, we can see that this is currently enabled. I'm gonna disable it and let's go back to the start of the animation. I'll move this down here actually, and let's hit play on the animation. So you can see that for that single frame, the box collider is enabled. So the reason why on trigger enter is not actually activating is because on trigger enter is looking specifically for a circle collider that's set to trigger. But for an enemy like a slime, we'd want that to be a non trigger collider because we do want physics to occur on this slime, such as being pushed away by the sword. So we need to change the function that we're adding right here. So the function we actually need to put in is on collision enter 2D. So this is going to be a rigid body collider that is not set to trigger mode, but is set to be able to interact with physics. So it's not going to change too much. We just have a collision 2D, which we can get the collider from. So we'll do collision dot collider, which is effectively getting the same collider down here. And then we can copy and paste this send message on hit sword damage up here. So this is essentially going to check for a physics rigid body and then send the hit damage to the game object. Let's go ahead and hit play and see if this occurs now. I'll open the console and let's add that in. So when we hit play and we swing at the slime from this side, you can see nothing happens. But actually, if we go over to the left, you can see the uh, box collider already hit. So that should be disabled at this point. But the box collider is actually able to send to the slime and you can see the slime is noting how much damage was sent to it one and that the slime was hit for damage so we should make sure that the sword hitbox is turned off and then in the animation window that whenever we attack it turns off here as well so i hit play we can see okay now when we swing at the slime it only hits once if we walk around like this you can see it's not doing anything only in that one frame of animation does it actually hit the slime and deal damage that's what we're looking for to make sure that when your game just starts and you run over the slime like this you don't want that sword collider to be enabled by default so make sure that your box collider is disabled by default uh, and on your prefab as well so that way it'll only actually be enabled once you swing the sword and swinging the sword will also disable the box collider so that it only hits at that exact frame when the sword is swinging Okay, so now let's start dealing some damage to the slime. Let's do a public health variable for the slime, and I will default the slime's health to three. Uh, when we get hit, the health is going to minus equal the damage. Okay, that needs a variable type. So you could do float or integer, depending on whether you want to allow decimal points or not. But you know what? It might even make sense to make this a property. So I'll do public float health. And this will have a set where health equals the value. But then if health is less than or equal to zero, 
then we'll destroy the game object for now, which is just going to remove it from the scene. All right, or destroy self, rather. So when the health is less than zero, we will destroy the game object that the script is attached to. Um, now, later, we're going to make this play an animation instead before we destroy the game object. But let's start with this. So we don't need this debug log. We just need to be able to hit this line three times. So let's hit play. We go over here. We swing at the slime one time, two times, three times. So the reason it's still doing that is because we're not setting the property. We're setting the variable. Let's also underscore the health variable to indicate we're not supposed to mess with that directly, but we're supposed to use the property. And once again, the whole reason for using the property is just that when we update the health, we can have something occur here on one package when the variable that the property affects changes to a certain number. And now we also need to get function for that property. So we're going to return underscore health and then that should clean this up. OK, so let's go back into the game. Swing at it a few times. One, two, three. Poof, the slime is gone. So that means our sword is working. It's doing damage. Uh, maybe we could throw some numbers above the head later so that we know how much damage we're doing. That could be cool. For now, let's change the slime's animation to the death animation when we reach that point. So we have the death trigger here. So let's set the death trigger on the animator. So first we need the animator in the slime script. So animator, animator. And uh, let's come down here and add our public void start. So animator equals get component animator on the anim on the slime game object. And with that, instead of destroying the game object here, we can do animator dot set trigger. Okay, and this is going to be death trigger, I believe. OK, now let's hit play. Go over here, swing two, three. OK, the death trigger is there, but it didn't actually uh, convert. So let's see what's going on there. Does the slime have its animator controller? Let's double click into that. So I'm going to try re-adding the animator controller right here. Let's close the animator window and bring it back. Animation animator. OK, yeah, there. Now it's appearing. OK, so in order to go to death, we actually need to slime hit to work first. So that's why it can't transition here which is what we would expect. So we need to be able to set the trigger hit and trigger death at the same time. So trigger death will come here. Let's also add in that whenever the health changes, if the value of the health being changed is less than one, as in it's a negative value, then we will trigger hit. So if value is less than zero, then we will do animator.set trigger hit. So this is just there in the case that maybe we would heal the slime at some point. Uh, so if there was a positive value coming in here, we wouldn't want to play the hit animation. That doesn't make sense. Let's give it a try now. So we hit play. Let's come over here. We swing at the slime and it doesn't actually transition. Interesting. Okay. So maybe to transition here, it actually needs an interruption source. So let's try next state here. Next state. And we swing, it doesn't do anything. Okay, next state, then current state. So when we have it in next state, you can see that it does transition here to slime hit, but then slime hit is transitioning back immediately. So what we need to do is make sure the exit time is checked for the transition between slime hit and idle, and this should be set to one. And down here, the exit time should be one. So the entire animation needs to play. And then let's do the hit. And now when we attack the slime, you can see it's playing the hit animation. Uh, not facing the right direction. We'll work on that. And we also need to make sure that it can go to the death state. So I think for that, we need the next state uh, interruption source. So let's do plus here. Attack one, two, three, four. Okay, let's take a look at the parameters while this happens. One, two, three. So the death trigger is there, but it's not actually going back. So I think what we'll do for that is we'll change the trigger for death into a Boolean for death. That way we can only go back to idle if death is not true or we'll call it alive actually. So Boolean alive or really is alive. We'll remove the death trigger 
delete that. And now when we return to idle, we have to check if is alive is true. And returning to run is alive is true, but going to death is alive is false. So now if we come here, we'll do animator.set boolean is alive false. And lastly, we just need the variable boolean is alive, which of course is going to be true while the slime is starting in the game. So it'll be set to false once the slime dies. I think that's just going to work better here for this animator controller. So I'll hit play. Let's attack the slime three times. And you can see that it actually played the death animation, but the first hit didn't actually transition it to slime hit. That's interesting. Okay, so the reason why the slime hit animation isn't actually playing is because uh, the value, when it comes in here, it's already being set to two. This isn't the negative one that comes from the damage. Uh, this is the new value that it's going to be updated to in the health property. That's my bad. So what we really should be doing is coming up here and checking if the value is less than the health which would imply that the new value is lower and it's taking damage. That's why the hit animation was only playing when the character was already dead because the health would have to have been less than zero. Okay, let's hit play. Check the animator on the slime. So right here for the exiting of slime to idle, I don't think we actually need an interruption source. Let me try hitting the slime. Okay, and it actually goes ahead and plays successfully the first time we hit. So we shouldn't need that for this one as well. If we hit, it goes ahead and plays it. So if we restart, we go over here, we hit the slime. It immediately goes to slime hit, but then it's doing slime death because is alive is already set to false. So maybe uh, at this, so maybe at the start of our script, we should make sure that is alive is set to, well, is alive at the start of the script just in case we haven't set it here properly. So if we go ahead and hit play, we can see that the slime is alive, even if that's incorrectly set when the script starts. So now we hit, it actually returns after our first hit. And after the third hit, the slime plays its death animation. So that's what we're looking for. I'm also going to check the Boolean here. The script bit for this, that's just a backup. Okay, next you can see that I always have to walk around to the left side to swing at the slime for it to actually hit. Even if I'm facing this way, if I swing, it's not going to hit the slime because our sword hitbox collider is not flipping sides currently to face the side where we're aiming the sword. So to fix that, we're going to need to set up a little script where we take the transform and uh, we reverse the direction as an offset from our player. So for instance, if I take this X and I make it negative one, you can see it's going to be on the exact opposite side here. So I could create a set of positions uh, that will be offsets depending on whether we're facing right or facing left, and then just update the game object here. We're using the sword hitbox script to use the correct position depending on which way our character's facing. So there'd probably be quite a few ways to do that. So face right. So I'll create a couple vector threes here, and we can default this to one. Let's see, what do I have there? Negative 0 0.9, and then zero for the Z. The Z is just there because it's a transform, but we don't actually need it. And uh, these are all floats. And then public vector three face left. It's going to be a new vector three, negative one, negative 0 0.9 F, and then zero. Okay, and that's a vector three, not a vector two, sorry. Okay, so now down here, uh, we have our values to update the transform. So we just need to update this at the right moment. So what will have happen is the player script can send out a message to any child game objects and we'll respond to that with like a on face left on face right callback function and set the position of the sword hitbox at that time. So let's create the callback here. So set direction and what really we'll do is facing right. Uh, since it's always going to be left or right for this character, we'll just have a is facing right boolean. So when we get this boolean, we'll check if is facing right. And if that's the case, then the game object dot transform 
dot position is going to be equal to face right. The same thing, but we're going to have it set to the face left values. Now I'll open the player controller script. And when this little bit happens, we can send out a message on the game object. So game object dot send message. And we just need the name of that function is facing right. But down here, we're going to make that false. So when we flip X, we're actually facing left. So we're not facing right. And when we're not flipping the X, then is facing right is set to true because we are facing right. So now if we go into sort hitbox, just make sure that this uh, function is the same name as the message we're receiving. Let's jump into the player, take a look at the hitbox. Okay, so that's our default direction that we're facing. So if we hit play, now we can go ahead and see if we're facing the right direction. But uh, we can see that is facing right has no receiver. So we should check in the sort hitbox if that is set up correctly. So I think actually what we need is broadcast message because this says every mono behavior in this game object. We want to access the child game objects here. So broadcast message. Yes, every mono behavior in this game object and its children. So that's why we were getting the error message because uh, the sword hitbox is actually a child of the player. Okay, so let's give that another shot. Hit play. And now let's try swinging at the slime from this direction. So remember, by default, it's facing right. But now we face left and it's flipping to the right direction. If we come over here, uh, we should be having the hitbox right around here. And it didn't quite work. Let's see. So that's working there. Then here, let's check this position of the sword hitbox. Okay, it's going all kinds of crazy there. Okay, so what's going on here is we're changing the world space of this transform. What we actually want is the local position, which is just the position of the hitbox relative to its parent. Okay, so that should fix the problem where this transforms number are going crazy. Let's hit play. Okay, we can swing from this side, which means it is flipping. And then we go over here, we swing again, and it's working again. Let's check the positions on the hitbox. And as you would expect, we have the one positive. Let's move around a little bit. Okay, when we face left, it's negative one. When we face right, it's one. Okay, so that is all we need to do for making sure that the sword faces the right direction at any time. And uh, as you can see, the slime is dying successfully. Let's add in another component for our on trigger hit. When we send the message to the collider game object, we don't want to just send the damage, but I actually want to send a force and a direction. So the direction I want the force to be is going to be the direction between, let's say, the parent game object of the character holding the sword and the sword hitbox itself. So that will create our direction. And then we need a force to multiply it by. And we'll add that force to the slime to make it knock back. So let's do public force and knock back force. I'll just give an arbitrary number of 500 right now. I have no idea if that's way too high or not. And then let's create a new function. So void calculate knockback. Okay. And we might not need to pass anything into that. So down here, we need a new function and we're, and we're going to return a vector two with it. So we're going to calculate the knockback. So this is going to be uh, the magnitude times the direction, giving us a force that we can apply to the slime. So first, let's get the game object of the character. So this will be game object dot get parent. So next, what we want to do with the sword swing is to calculate a force that we can apply to the slime in order to create a knockback effect. So we need to get the direction somehow. We could calculate the direction between the player game object and the sword's hitbox to determine which direction it's going to face, or we could just take the facing direction, which would probably be even easier. Uh, or we could calculate the direction between the sword hitbox and the slime. So that might give a little bit more variation in which way the slime goes, because the direction of the slime will be a little bit different, even if it falls inside of the hitbox. So we could start with that and see how it goes. The next what we're going to want to do is figure out the direction between the player and the slime to calculate which direction that we should be adding a force to the slime for a knockback. So we want to get access to the parent game object here and then compare that to the position of the colliding game object. So we can do game object dot get component in parent. And the one we're looking for is the transform. So we'll get the position there. 
expected to parent position. Okay, so now we could do something like expected to direction equals, and we're going to do the parent position minus collider dot game object dot transform dot position. Okay, and I, I guess we need to make this a vector three initially so that you can do math between a vector three and a vector three. Anyway, we're going to get the normalized value of that, and then I'm going to cast it as a vector two. Since we're doing a 2D game, uh, we only really care about the X, Y here, at least for now. So we have the direction here, and we want to add a force to that. So this is normalized, so it shouldn't change the magnitude itself. Move the send message down here after we've calculated everything. And let's get rid of this debug log. We're going to add in the third parameter, which is going to be knockback force as a vector. And then the knockback force will calculate right here, which is going to be the direction times. I'll actually call this knockback force here. So let's make this knockback and knockback force. The force, just a, another word for magnitude here. So let's do public float knockback force equals 500 just something arbitrary and we'll pass that in as so at this point we can see one of the flaws with the send message function which is that we're not able to send a vector 2 directly we could split it into two separate components like a float x and a float y but a better way to handle this uh, also rather than sending this to every model behavior and seeing if it has the function we can just create a type that any character that should be damaged can inherit from. So for the slime mono behavior, we could either have this implement an interface, which would be damageable, or we could have it extend from a base class that we would apply to any character in the game, which is able to be hit and take damage. So in this case, using an interface might be a bit more flexible than extending from a base class of character or enemy because then we can have classes that can be damageable, but don't necessarily need to extend from that base class. So let's set up an interface, and that interface will define some things that a damageable object in the game should be required to have. Uh, namely, that it will have a health property, and that it will be able to implement some kind of on-hit function. So inside of our assets, we could create another folder for interface scripts. I think I'll go ahead and do that. So I'm going to right click on the assets folder in my uh, code editor. And I'm going to put in interfaces here, just to keep any script that will be a interface type here, organized. So let's create a new one, I'm going to create the interface I damageable. So this will be an interface for any damageable object. So rather than typing public class, I damageable, we're going to be typing public interface I damageable. Okay, let's go ahead and save that. And then we want to make sure that this slime will inherit from I damageable. Let's open up uh, the Unity editor again and let's check for errors. And then let's make sure that it kind of refreshes everything. We should make sure that this uh, file is actually declared as a .cs script file. So if we refresh the Unity editor, we should be able to see our script here. And, and as long as that script is in the project as a CS file, uh, we should be able to get the damageable interface here. So now if we declare anything that something that implements iDamageable should have, It'll automatically check here to see if we do have those properties or functions. And if it doesn't, it'll recommend. And if it doesn't, it'll tell us that we need to implement those, which is handy. So let's implement the property public float health. It's going to need a set get. And we're also going to need a void on hit function, which is going to take a float damage. And we're also going to need a vector to knockback so let's make sure that uh vector 2 is using unity engine there so obviously depending on your game an on hit function may not necessarily need to do a knockback so you could decide how to handle that maybe some objects just ignore the knockback completely or maybe when it's a certain type of object you would just add a 
on a hit that only uses damage instead of damage and knockback. So now let's just jump into the slime script, which is implementing this interface. You can see we have an overridden function. There's two types here for the on hit. And it says that we don't have them. So I'm going to control period here, implement the interface, and whatever we don't have is going to pop in here at the bottom. And we can make these functions public. That way, other game objects would be able to access them. If it makes sense, we could change the name from on hit later if we want. But let's get public void on hit. And then we'll take this non interface one and uh, copy paste it in here. Get rid of that. Okay, so that'll clear up those errors. And now for the on hit where we have a knockback, we do health minus equal damage. And then we need to apply the knockback force. So to apply a force on the slime, we're going to need to get access to this rigid body component. So rigid body 2D RB. And then let's go down here to on start. We'll do RB equals get component rigid body 2D. Okay. So now we have the rigid body in our script. So when we have a knockback, we want to apply force to this slime. So rigid body dot add force. And this is going to be the knockback force. So what's cool about how we use the interface is if we wanted to make another enemy or NPC type that could be knocked back, we would just need to implement this interface and then create our own version of uh, the script down here. Now, if we know for a fact that every type of enemy is going to do this in exactly the same way, then you could instead inherit not from mono behavior, but an enemy script. And then that enemy script is based on mono behavior. So you would do slime is a type of enemy. And then when you write the enemy script, that would have these uh, base functions that apply to every single type of enemy implementing on hit once rather than for every individual script. You can also, of course, combine them. So rather than implementing the eye damageable here, you could do that at the enemy level. So enemy would be a model behavior eye damageable. And then slime would just be an enemy, which already implements this stuff. So just think about how you want to organize your C sharp project uh, down the road as you kind of expand it. Okay, so now let's come back to here for our sword hitbox. So what we're going to be checking on this collider is does it implement eye damageable? So let's cast the game object of the collider as a eye damageable, which will make sure that it actually implements that. So eye damageable, I'll just call it damageable object equals eye damageable of the collider. So if there's an eye damageable interface on whatever script is on this game object, then it's going to grab that. If damageable object is not equal or null, then we're going to damage it. And I'm going to say else. We want to debug a. We want to debug log a warning. Collider does not implement i damageable. So, so how I imagine the sword swings are that anytime we hit something with the sword swing, the only colliders we should be checking for are going to be things that should be interacted with. So that might mean filtering by an enemy physics layer, and therefore it should have this. And we want to know if it doesn't for some reason. So that's why I'm logging a warning here, just so that we can uh, kind of be sure that anything we're hitting implements this and that we're told if it doesn't. So uh, what this allows us to do, rather than using collider send message, is that we can do damageable object dot on hit. And we want to add the damage, sword damage, and the knockback. So calling the function directly here is both more efficient and we are certain that whatever this object is, it's going to implement this method. Um, so it should always go off as long as we've written the code over on the slime page here. So if we have a problem, it's going to be in this function implementation, uh, not in this bit. And it's also more efficient because once we get that I damageable, we don't need to send this message to every component or broadcast message to every child game object. But technically speaking, you could just do send message on hit sword damage knockback x value and then comma knockback y have three parameters. And you could technically do it that way.
Okay, so we should be able to bring this knockback value into the slime script, which is going to add a force. Let's see what actually happens in reality. So, so if we check the console, uh, we can clear that, hit play, and I'm going to swing the sword. So we hit it. Specified cast is not valid. All right, so we probably need to apply it to the game object. So this is casting the collider component, not the game object. So we could do I damage ball collider dot game object. Uh, that would be one way. Or we could do collider dot get component I damageable, which is probably the more direct way to do it. And then we don't need a cast. So the get component really runs on the game object, I believe. But let's go ahead and hit play and see how that works. So we hit play. We're going to swing. Okay, nothing happens there. But the on hit is playing. It's just not really applying the force. So we can come in here and I'm going to do a quick debug log of what the knockback is. And I'll say force plus knockback. So this is the vector two. So we should see two numbers pop up here, the X and the Y force. So let's hit play. I'm going to swing. And there's our force. If we come over here, is the number going to change? Yes, it does. Because the direction between our objects is different. I did actually notice it moved there. So what we probably need here is actually just a much stronger value for the knockback force. Let's try increasing it by 10 and seeing what happens. Now I believe for these rigid bodies, things like the mass and the linear drag are going to matter here. So it's going to be playing around with the numbers. But you can see that at least we're getting some movement here. But if we look here, it's actually kind of sucking the slime towards the player. So I think what I did is reversed the numbers here so it should actually be the colliders transform position minus the parents position so this should reverse the direction that the force is applying in okay let's hit play swing okay it's getting pushed back right uh we can also try turning down the linear drag seeing how that affects the slime Okay, and it gets knocked back way more. That actually looks a lot better. Maybe we make the linear drag something like 8 and swinging the value. And now we're swinging at it. It gets knocked back. I think I liked it better at 5, actually. And I'm going to apply that to the prefab so we can have some more slimes with the same value. So we apply it. It's sort of working. Uh, I think the direction isn't always how we want it. So we'll have to play around with the positions and which direction it's going. But the force is applying correctly. So if we duplicate our slimes here, then we can go ahead and swing at them. So that's one slime, two slimes, three slimes. We can kill them all. Now, uh, when they are in that, that state, of course, they should not be able to be interacted with in terms of physics anymore. So possibly when it's hit or when the character dies, we'll have to... I'm not sure if it's either going to be disabling the circle collider or turning off the simulation, but something like that, just prevent it from being hit again. So if we go in here to the I damageable interface, I think this would be a good place to, to declare a new requirement for any damageable character to disable the physics side. And I guess that would be to make it untargetable. Okay, and we'll probably just add this as a animation event. So in slime, let's implement that interface. So we will grab the rigid body and try simulated equals false. I guess it would be sense to make the reverse public void. So for a damageable object, we would want another property to be able to set whether the character is able to be targeted and hit or not. So I'm going to make a Boolean property here. For now, I'll call it targetable, but that might change. Set get. And then in the slime, which implements it, we're going to need to create that new property. So down here, uh, public bool targetable equals true by default. Git will just be return targetable. Uh, but the set function will be a bit more intricate here. So let's do the brackets. This could also have the brackets. I'll do the brackets for the get function as well. Okay, clean up the errors. Okay, and then for the set, targetable will obviously be set to the value. But when we set the value, I'm going to want to churn off 
the physics on the RB, the rigid body. So RB dot simulated. So if it's targetable, then it is going to be simulated. Otherwise, we're turning off the physics and it won't be simulated. So let's see if that actually does what I want it to do. So let's hit play and swing at it a few times. So the first few hits still work. But after that, it's uh, still actually simulated. Oh, of course, that's because we haven't actually used this. So targetable. I'll come into the health is less than or equal to zero. And uh, that's where I'll set targetable equals false. Okay, let's go ahead and try again. So one swing, two swing, three swings. And all of the physics disappeared here. So that's also not what we want. What we probably want is to turn off the circle collider instead. So let's get the collider to D, call it physics collider. And then on start physics collider equals get component collider 2d we don't really care about the shape and then this physics collider instead of turning simulation off we're going to turn physics collider dot enabled equals the value this way when the third sword swing hits the physics are still going to act on it but right after that it's not going to accept any other input so let's go swing one two, three. Okay, so the third hit goes off, but after that, you can't target it anymore. And it's basically just a image on the screen. So we won't be able to run into it, get bumped over. So we won't be able to push it around. It won't be able to push us around. And really at the end of that death animation, we're going to remove it from the screen anyway. So that's kind of what we're looking for there uh, as far as making it untargetable. Next, I want any damageable object in the game to be able to remove itself. So I will do public void remove self, or we'll do destroy self actually. So this will be a function that will implement so that at the end of our death animation, we could just destroy the object from the game. Uh, this might be redundant, but the, the reason I'm creating this is so that it's available as an animation event. Let's jump into the animation editor for the slime and see if that's actually needed there. So animation or really is the animation window. Let's go to death at the final frame here. Let's add an animation event. Click on it. Uh, let's go to the inspector. I guess we do kind of need it. So let's do destroy self here. OK, and now let's hit the slime three times. One, two, three. The requested operation caused a stack overflow. That's probably because I used the same name for this as the game object destroy self. So we can rename that. Uh, let's call it. Let's call it on object destroyed. I think that makes sense. That way, it's not always going to necessarily remove the object from the game but maybe something maybe some other objects that are damageable will do things a little differently here we'll do game object dot destroy and i guess i'll just put game object here this bit might be redundant so we could just do destroy game object let's give that a shot okay so animation the animation event click on inspector and Okay, we probably actually need to delete this animation event and re-add it so that this refreshes. Okay, interesting, it's not showing up. So maybe the script just needs to recompile here. So on object destroyed, on object destroyed. Yep, okay, compiling the scripts. Okay, click on the slime. Death animation, final frame. We have the animation event on object destroyed. And then we hit play. Let's hit a few times. Third time. Death animation place, object removed from the game. Okay, that's what we're looking for. Okay, another fun thing I kind of want to add is that when we hit the slime, we want it to kind of change colors. So I'm just going to do it the quick way here, rather than creating, like, say, a custom shader for it. I'm just going to do it in the animation window for hit. So let's jump into the slime. Uh, we can play the hit animation here. And we just want to add a property for the sprite render, which is going to be the color. So the color, uh, of course, at frame one, we're just going to have that set here to the full values. But here, let's change it towards a red color. So I'm just going to 
set these values to something else and make it red. And then here we can kind of restore it to a less red color. Okay, and then let's hit play. So <laughs> there we go, just changing the color on a few frames of the hit animation. Now we can hit play, we can hit our slime, and that looks a lot cooler. It's really obvious when the slime gets hit now. Maybe the uh, frame here is a little too strong, so I'll change... I'll change the value to be slightly negative, and let's uh, give it a shot. Maybe we lower the red down. Okay, and let's update that. Okay, hit play one more time. It's still very, very red. Okay, we'll hit again. Maybe these values need to be positive. So let's try that. Just kind of playing with the numbers here. So we hit... I think I just made it too dark. So let's make the first one 0 0.9, then 0 0.4, 0 0.4. And then this can be 1, 0 0.6, 0 0.6. Let's hit play. I'll hit them. Okay, that, that's a little bit more tame. Maybe a little too tame even. So make this 0 0.3, 0 0.3. And this one will be 0 0.45, 0 0.45. We still want it to look quite bad and then we hit and we get our death animation okay yep that'll do decently okay uh with the sword hit i do want to fix one more thing which is sometimes the slime doesn't move in the direction we expect so like right there i hit it from right to left but then it went upwards on our screen so we need to recalculate the hit direction for the force knockback Okay, so when it comes to the problem of trying to hit the slime with the transform of the sword swing, if I take a look at the transform on the player, uh, you can see that due to the shape of the sprite, the center point is right up here. So showing the whole sprite, it looks like this. So the center point is where the transform calculates from. Um, and that's because of how I sliced up the sprite sheet. So we can use this point to calculate for hitting the slime. But for a sprite sheet like this, which has a lot of extra space on each sprite, uh, we can go into the sprite editor and we can re-slice them to have uh, more appropriate sizing. So I'm going to hit slice, going to do smart instead of delete existing so that it doesn't mess with any animations. And I'll do the pivot custom at 0 0.5 and 0 0.15. So let's go ahead and do a automatic slice here for the character, which is going to take the center point more to the character's face. Now we could do some other things to adjust this, but uh, this is probably gonna be the quickest, easiest way uh, to get pretty good results. So now if we apply that and look at our character, we can see the transform has been adjusted down to here. In order to make sure that we're using that transform location for calculating our slime knockback, the right way to get the parent position is transform.parent, which is the transform of the parent, dot position instead of game object dot get component and parent transform which is actually just going to get you the sword hitbox transform not the player controller transform so we use that position to calculate the direction for the knockback multiply it by the force and our result will look something like this so if we're below the slime we can actually hit it upwards and if we are right next to it it hits it to the right and we also don't have the problem of being too close. Uh, on the third swing, of course, the knockback won't allow it to go anywhere because of how we set up the slime. Maybe while it's still playing the on hit, we uh, don't lock the movement. So if we want to change that, let's go into the slime script. And instead of turning off the rigid body simulation, we'll only disable the physics collider so that nothing else can interact with it after that point. So back in the game, Let's hit it three times, and you can see on the third time that the uh, slime does keep moving after it's hit. So you might prefer that instead. But uh, we won't be able to hit it a fourth time. As you can see, the, the fourth hit didn't do anything, and I think the slime was still there uh, before it deleted from the game. So uh, that will pretty much do it for damaging the slimes. Next, let's set up the ability for the slime to damage the player. So the slime already has a circle collider. We can use this to check on collision. Uh, with any kind of damageable character. So we don't really need a trigger. It's just going to be the slime running into a character. 
So let's add into the script what we want to have happen when the slime collides with a damageable character, which might be the player or it might be another enemy. And then you can further filter which enemies or players you actually want the slime to be able to damage. But for right now, let's just make it uh, anything I damageable. So public void on collision enter 2D. And I believe that this gives you a collider. To make sure that this is working, let's just debug a test log. Okay, so I'm going to run into the slime now. Okay, so that didn't work. Void on collision enter 2D. Collision 2D. Ah, that's why. Okay, and we also don't need this to be public. So void on collision enter 2D. We get a collision. So let's go ahead and test that. And we bump into the characters. Okay, I misspelled collision there. Okay, so running into the slime. Okay, this time it actually does something. So now what we can do is check the collision collider and see if it's a damageable character. So I damageable damageable equals collider dot uh, collider. And we can do get component I damageable from that if we want. Okay, so if there is a damageable component, so in other words, if this doesn't equal null, then we can run some function on that damageable, which I guess will look pretty similar to this. So we're going to do on hit. So damageable object on hit. And let's do the version that doesn't have a force knockback. So the slime will need a damage component up here. Public, public float damage equals one or whatever number you want. And we'll pass that in for the I damageable. Okay, so next we need some component on the player, which is going to implement I damageable. We could put everything in the player controller if we wanted to, but that'll make this kind of become a mess at some point. And I'd rather this mostly control the movement and the animation of the player. So I think what I'm going to do is create a new component script and put that on the player instead. So if we click on player, I'm going to come down here to the bottom add a component new script and I could just call this player health for now I suppose create an add and then in the project let's make sure we move that into the player characters folder I'm gonna move the slime script into the slime folder I'm gonna move the slime script into the slime folder as well just like that keeping everything where it's supposed to go so player health is going to implement I damageable and let's add the interface here so we'll get rid of all this. So at the very least for now, we need on hit float damage. We're going to need a health variable. We'll set the player health to five. Or let's make it three to start. And the targetable will be true initially. Okay, so to make it so that the player can be damaged, we need some script to implement I damageable. We could put it right in the player controller script if we wanted to, just comma I damageable implement the interface. But I imagine that probably just about everything is going to be uh, about the same between the slime getting damaged and the player getting damaged. So what I'm actually going to do is create a. So what I'm actually going to do is create a, a side script, one component that will be something like character health manager or something along those lines. Take all of the stuff that is related to that and put it in that uh, rather than the slime specific script. That way, any character that needs to be able to be damaged, have a health, uh, receive a knockback, we'll just use the same script over and over again. And we don't need to keep rewriting things. So in the characters folder, I'm gonna create a new file. I'll, be, I'll call it damageable character dot cs and then i'm just going to copy everything from slime i'm going to put it into here let's go up to the top i'm going to rename this to be damageable character implements i damageable and then i'll remove all of this stuff that is specific to a slime from this and just put that back in the slime script so let's see uh the damage value is something that a damageable character doesn't need animator rigid body I suppose we can leave those here for now. Physics Collider. Everything to this point coming down here. The animator, we might need that component here. Rigid Body Physics Collider on hit. The implementation of that damageable interface. 
and we'll come down here to the bottom. So this on collision enter, that is the slime's attack. So I'm going to remove that. So this will be our damageable character. And the slime specific components are just going to actually be this bit right here for now. Now the slime no longer implements I damageable. And now we just need to make sure that the slime object and the main character object both have the damageable character component. And then that can take care of the health system for both characters. So on the player, let's add in, well, I guess we have to resolve some errors first. So let's see, slime.cs, that seems like an extra copy. So I'm just going to remove that. Okay. And now let's see if we can find that component. Damageable character. So health three, targetable, yes. And let's add that to the slime as well. Uh, make sure you apply it to the prefab. So let's open up the prefab for slime. Let's add in the damageable character component. Let's hit play and actually see if everything still works. So if we hit the slime, well, it is able to get hit, uh, but let's see what's going on. Parameter hit does not exist. That's probably referring to the parameters for the uh, main character. So we would want to have those so that we can actually have the character get hit in a minute. So let's open up the animator window for the player. I'm going to add the boolean is alive and I'm going to add the trigger hit. So let's hit play. Let's see if we get those warnings still. I'm going to go around hitting the slime and it's still getting hit. It still dies like normal. So nothing really changed about the slime. We just broke the script into two different components. Okay, now if we edit the script here for the slime, and we can see that as long as when we collide with a character that has the damageable component, we're going to apply that damage. And the damageable character script will apply it the same way for a player character as a slime. So short of the animations working right now, if I hit play and I run into three slimes, we may be able to actually have the player object be removed. So let's see if we click on player, and we come down here, we can see that the health was set to zero. Um, can keep going, probably. Nope, the uh, character has already been made untargetable. But the reason nothing happened is because we didn't have the on object destroyed callback function happen at the end of our animation, because we didn't actually transition to those animations for the hit and the death animation for the player. So we may actually, I'm going to go ahead and reboot Unity to see if we can clear up some of these errors. Okay, and we can see there's not really a player hit animation, so maybe there won't be any knockback for the player character. So we just want to transition to die. So no matter what state the player is in when it dies, we want to immediately transition to die. So let's inspect the transitions. Turn off has exit time, transition duration zero, no exit time zero, and then no exit time zero. If we click on the slime, we can see that for this transition, it's basically the same just when the hit condition occurs. But in the case of the player, it's just going to be when it's dead. So is alive is true, is alive is true, is alive is true. Okay, and we, if we preview that animation, well, there we go. Actually, those are supposed to be false, false, and then false. So if we hit play, okay, we don't go there. But if we take enough damage, you can see that we can get to that uh, death animation state. And there's no return after that. So one, two, three. Now, when we get to this point, we do want to disable the ability to move around our character. So I'll add in another Boolean for this targetable, uh, which will be when we turn targetable off, we also want to disable the simulation of the physics. So like I had before, rb.simulated equals false. We can have as something that occurs here, but we don't always want that to occur for every character. So we'll have this Boolean up here, disable simulation. I'll default that to false, uh, but for some characters like the player, we might actually want to just completely disable the rigid body's physics simulation uh, when it gets to a death state. So let's go back in here. Down at the bottom, I'm just going to check disable simulation. Let's apply that to the prefab. Now let's get hit three times. One, two, three. And now you can see the player can't move at all. But for the slimes, when they get hit the third time, 
They're still in a simulation, they just can't be targeted anymore. So even though we are using the same component by just having a little toggle like that, we can make it work a little bit differently for each character rather than needing to create completely separate scripts. So next I might want to make running into the slime actually knock back the player a bit. So like the sword hitbox, we'll have something very similar. Let me go ahead and copy this bit over here into the slime. And then rather than just damageable on hit, Let's take the damage down there. Public float, knockback force. I'll set that to 300 and then damage ball. Since we need the collider down here and this is an on collision enter, I'll get the collider 2D, collider equals coal.collider. This will just save us a little bit of typing. So collider down here, collider down there. And this way we can basically have the same thing that the sword hitbox was doing. Now that is a bit of reusing the same code. Uh, for right now, I think that's okay because maybe we would change how it actually works for the slime specifically in the future and not just have like the same kind of knockback. So if we hit play now, let's run into the slime. Okay, not really doing much to change the physics on the character. Let, let's see here, double click, transform.parent.position. Ah, right, so the slime doesn't need to get its parent's position, it just needs to get its own position. So transform.position, and if we hit play, let's run into the slime. Okay, a little hard to tell if it was working. Oh, yeah, I do see a little bit of a knockback bump. Let's make it significantly stronger, though. And uh, once again, this will be a point in time where you need to play around with the numbers on the rigid body for the player. So, get that knockback. Let's check the player. What is the mass and angular drag? Let's just make the number something very high and see what happens. Knockback force of 5,000. Oof. Okay. Well, that definitely does something. 2,500 knockback force, 1,500. So when we add the force, maybe we can come in here and change the force mode to a impulse. I think it might be force mode, force by default, but we do want it to be kind of instantaneous. So let's see, let's see if that changes anything for how our physics works. So I get hit, let's hit the slime. Okay, it's definitely knocking back way too far. I'll lower the numbers down on both the player and the slime. So let's see, knockback of 200. We bump into here. Okay, and let's swing that. Okay, <laughs> the slime clearly gets propelled like way too far. Yeah, so it's quite different if, it, if you're using knockback force, which would probably expect it to be more on a per frame update on the force than an instant impulse. So I'm just going to tweak this until we get something good. Okay, that, that looks pretty nice, actually. It's still way overpowered, but uh, let's make it 15 for the knockback force on the player. Hit the slime. Okay, that looks good, actually. And then when the slime bumps into us, I, I think that's okay. Uh, we, we can make it a little stronger, though. So I guess we'll make it 800. Let's revert that. So it works really well when the slime has no forces acting on it because then everything just becomes a uh, physics simulation here. But when the uh, player's not moving, you can see it's kind of an instant jot out. But when I am moving the player, the velocity that we're setting on the player movement kind of completely negates that way too much. So this might be a good time to actually change how the player moves with a force rather than just setting the velocity directly. And we can see how that will affect the movement of our character. So first off, for the slime, I'm going to take the knockback force to 100 for now. And the sword hitbox force is set to 15. I'm also going to make that the default up here in the script. So the slime knockback force, 100F, 100, 100 as a float. Now let's go into the player controller for the character. So rather than directly setting the velocity, I'm going to add a force. And let's say move input times move speed times delta time, time delta time. And we're still going to use something like alert function to limit this, but uh, let's let's see how this changes the movement already. So if we hit play, okay, now we're running with the force. If I run into the slime, okay, you can see I got knocked completely off the map. That's kind of crazy. So uh, let's take the knockback force, which is a thousand for some reason, and let's make it 15. Okay, yeah, yeah, that looks much nicer. Maybe maybe even lower, like 10. Hit play. We run into it. We get knocked back. We run into here. Okay, the, probably the reason for that is 
that slime is yeah has its own knockback force this needs to be reverted to the force of the prefab so let's bump into it okay now our character is going to need a uh, stronger move speed than that so i'll make it let's say 500 so let's run around now and we can see the character just is sliding around way too much so i'm going to add in some linear drag one is a bit strong maybe 0.5 this is definitely going to be a matter of just tweaking all of the numbers. Let's get the movement speed 500 here. Okay, that's looking a lot nicer. Still quite floaty. wonder if changing the angular drag would help with that. Okay, so let's try 0 0.75, 0 0.4, movement speed of 600. Oh, that was actually kind of cool. They bounced off each other. It's technically, uh, they're still damageable characters, so they can damage each other. I want to see that again, actually. Wow. Yeah, that's neat. Um... Currently, this is working all right. Uh, definitely needs some tweaking of the numbers. But let's try hitting right. And you can see the character can just keep going faster and faster and faster and faster. So we need to kind of limit that. So in player controller, we want to interpolate. We want to use a linear interpolation function. We want to bring down the speed to a maximum speed at a friction rate. So basically, uh, we'll just never allow the character to keep moving too fast consistently and then just keep skating off the screen. So let's do if rb.velocity is greater than max speed, then we'll do rb.velocity equals effective to lerp rb.velocity max speed. And uh, we could just use idle friction for right now. So this isn't going to work right now because that's a... Uh, that's a vector two, not a magnitude. So let's do velocity dot magnitude is greater than max speed. So what we'll have to do here, um, once again, because the max speed isn't a vector two, but rather it's a float, is break the velocity into two components. So so we'll take the magnitude of the max speed. Let's do math f dot lerp, and this is going to be rb velocity dot magnitude max speed and idle friction, and we can put over here limited speed equals that uh, we'll have to get the direction of the original velocity rb dot velocity dot normalized okay and we'll times that by the limited speed and set that to the new velocity rb dot velocity equals this so the normalized value gives us the direction and then this will give us the new magnitude after we do so with this math function the only question is is that max speed too low well, uh, let's go ahead and try and find out. So if we come in here, let's keep trying to run. And as you can see, yes, the, the player is definitely being limited now. If I change the max speed to four, let's see how that goes. Yep. Okay, we have that hard limit on speed. So that's nice. We can accelerate, but only to a certain point. So let's make the max speed five and just test it a little more. Feels good. Maybe the linear drag is a bit strong, though. I'm going to lower that to 0 0.6. Okay, that's not bad. And as you can see, the rigid body in dynamic mode just calculates a lot of the physics for you. So when it comes to knocking things back, you just need to apply the force and everything else will be managed here. Let's change the slime's knockback to be a bit stronger. 20, I'll bump into it. I think I want it stronger than that even. So let's make it 30. Okay, kind of working. Uh, it, it definitely needs some adjustments. So the movement's definitely working. What we'd need to do is tweak the numbers. Okay, so to make the enemies actually do something, we need to add some way of detecting the player and then some way of moving towards the player. So I'm gonna go into the prefab for the slime. Let's create a new trigger zone. So I'm gonna do a circle collider 2D. I'm gonna set it to trigger. So this is just for detection. So in the slime character, I think I'll add a new child game object and I'll call this detection zone. Let's add a new collider here, mark it as is trigger, edit the collider and well, let's just make the radius something like five, three seems more appropriate. So the idea here is that if the player is found within, so the idea here is that if the player is found within this zone, the slime is just going to move towards it um, at a certain speed. So let's add a new script. I'll call this uh, detection zone. Detection zone, create and add. Let's open this up. This is, of course, going to need that uh, circle collider component. So collider2d 
uh, collider. On start, we'll do collider .dit component collider 2D. And then let's have a public list of game objects, which are currently detected. So detected objects. So we'll add the on trigger enter 2D. Let me check for the sword hitbox. So this needs a collider 2D collider. Put that in there. So we'll keep track of when objects enter the range and when they leave the range, which probably actually makes it more appropriate up here to do a list of collider 2Ds because you can always just do collider.gameObject. So we can just reference it by the component, not the game object specifically. So whenever a trigger enters, we'll add it to the list. So detected objects dot add collider and then void on trigger exit 2D. This means that a collider is leaving the range. So we will remove it from the list. Detected objects dot remove collider. If, let's see if we can see the list in the inspector by default. Okay, yes, you can maintain that. So let's hit play and uh, see what happens on one of these slimes. Okay, it looks like the list hasn't been created yet. So equals new list collider 2D. Okay, maybe the collider does. Once again, getting the collider directly like this, uh, it doesn't work because we're not specifying circle collider. So I'll just make that public and then we can set which collider we want in the inspector. That way, in case we ever use a different type of collider here, it'll be fine. We just need to set it here, make it in the prefab. Okay, now if we hit play, let's look at the slime, the detection zone. You can see that it's actually detecting already all of these objects which have left the zone. If I leave, the player leaves and we can re-enter. So that part of this is working just fine. So to make sure that we only move towards players, we can use something like the tag up here to... We'll mark the player as a player. Okay, so if I go out here and we take the player, I'm going to take the tag and make it player. And then when we're looking at the detection zone, something enters here. We only want to do something with it if the game object has the tag player. So if we check in here, if collider.gameObject.tag equals player. So when untrigger enter happens, we want to check the collider for a specific tag. Let's put the tag that we care about up here. Public string tag target equals player. So we get the collider game object dot tag and we check if that is equal to the tag target. So if that's the case, then that is where we're going to add that to the list. We could also do the same thing down here. So it probably isn't required, but I guess it makes sense. Don't have to waste time looking in the list if we've already checked the tag and the tag doesn't match. So now when we hit play, we can see that the only object that enters or leaves the area is the player. Now we just need to have the slime have a separate state when the detection zone is activated. Or in other words, when it has detected an object. And then we'll move the slime towards that player until the player has left the zone. So in the slime script, we're going to need reference to a detection zone detection zone and void update or really fixed update for physics movement if detection zone dot detected objects dot zero we'll just get the first item in the list for now since i mean there should only be one player so it should work fine at least at the moment if there is a object in the list we'll move towards detected object. Otherwise, uh, we basically do nothing. So uh, the slime needs a movement speed now. So let's just make something arbitrary. Movement speed equals 500F. May or may not need to limit it here. We'll, we'll see how it goes. But we do need to add the force. So add force, move input times move speed. The input is actually just going to be is going to be the direction between this game object and the detected object. So here we can get Let's see, this is a Collider 2D. Let's copy paste that in there. Uh, maybe this is a little redundant. So we need to calculate the direction to the target um, object. So vector 2 
direction is going to be equal to the target minus the current. So detected object zero dot transform dot position minus transform dot position. And then we want to normalize that vector. So it's just a direction, but has no magnitude with it. And then we'll take that direction down here. So rigid body add force. I guess we are going to need uh, access to the rigid body as well. So public rigid body 2D RB. Void start, we get the rigid body. RB equals get component rigid body 2D. Okay. And then we can apply the force there. So let's see how this goes. If uh, it moves at all, then uh, we're doing good so far. So we hit play. And it has no idea where we're trying to move towards. Which is interesting because it definitely does have a player inside of there. Okay, this 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 must be for the um, other slimes which do not detect the player. So I guess what we'll do here is we'll see if that list is empty. Detection zone dot detected objects dot. Well, let's see. Count is greater than zero, and then we'll do detection zone dot detected objects at position zero dot transform dot position and let's see if that clears up all the error messages here so we hit play and it's still there so uh so what's actually happening here is that we haven't set the detection zone so uh in the slime script we just want to bring in the detection zone and port it down there uh, the rigid body also does not need to be public because we're only using that inside of the script and we have no need to assign it in the inspector so let's sit back Hit play. Okay, now our, all the slimes are actually moving towards the player, which is great. You can see that uh, when we exit the area, then um, the slimes stop moving towards us. And when we re-enter, they try to follow us. Let's see if it can go around the walls. Okay, no, it cannot, which is how we would expect it to be. But it will kind of slide along the walls, which uh, works well enough for now. And as an added bonus, if the two slimes run into each other, <laughs> they will actually damage and knock each other back, which is really awesome. So, yep. Okay, nice. So you might notice that because we've added some extra colliders that occasionally it'll say collider does not implement I damageable. So when we're looking with the sword hitbox to see if a collider would hit, uh, currently we're logging that the collider doesn't implement it, but we don't really need this anymore, I think for right now, because if uh, it hits a trigger collider, that collider is obviously not going to implement I damageable. So we don't need to make note of that. We just need to completely ignore it and move on. So this will still pick up on the colliders, but because it doesn't implement I damageable, we don't do anything with it and we wait for the real object that is actually damageable to show up there. So if we hit play now, uh, we can still see that the physics and everything work fine. If I hit stuff then it does what you would expect. Of course, the uh, slimes can go back and forth too. So uh, the last thing I think I want to do for this video is to make numbers appear above the head to indicate when damage is done. So in the damageable character script, we'll have a little box here for a text template. And we'll show that with the damage out every time the character takes damage. So let's create the text template as a prefab over here. So I'm going to, let's see, let's use UI text text mush pro. I guess we will need to import the essentials into the project. Okay, so we have the basics there. Let's double click here. That text is way too big. So let's shrink it down. I'm going to add this VCR OSD mono font into the project so that we can use it for the text we're going to show on the screen. So here I have uh, the font in there. Let's right click, create a folder for fonts. I'll drag this in. For the text, we need to add a font asset. Now, I think you don't drag them in directly. I think what you actually do is you right click on it, you do create, and then you do text mesh pro, create font asset, which puts it right there. And now you can drag it into that and you can see the font changes. So now we need to still shrink this dramatically. Let's find the size, something like two, or can we make that one even? And then we'll move it. Well, let's see, in game view, can we see the text? Nope. Maybe it's too small. Let me try increasing the size. 32. 
Okay, so here we have the text actually showing on the screen, really small. So we could increase that a bit. Then I'm going to change the position to zero, zero. So the idea here is that it'll start here and then just keep rising. So we'll need to increase the speed for the text to rise. Let me add a new script, health text, create an ad. So inside of the health text script, we're going to need a public float uh, time to live for the text. So we'll make it, um, let's actually make it half a second by default. And then, and then let's get access to the vertex color on the text mesh pro text. So public text mesh. Let's see, is that actually what we want here? Text, text mesh, I think so. Equals get component. Okay, and then let's drag that in here. That's not what we want. And next, we're going to need to get the text mesh pro. So public text mesh pro. I'll call it text mesh using text mesh pro. So when our model behavior starts, we need to get access to that text mesh equals get component text mesh pro. Okay, and then we'll need to start the timer. So public float. So float time elapsed equals zero F. And then on every frame, we'll do time elapsed plus equals time dot delta time. If time elapsed, it's greater than time to live. Then we're going to remove this from the scene. So destroy. So to destroy game object. I think that should still work with the canvas objects because they are a game object showing over here. So we'll see. And yeah, we can start with that and we'll see if it goes away. So we'll hit play 0.5 seconds and it disappears. So we'll have to give it a raising speed to uh, basically float above the character. So public float, float speed equals 50. I guess. So we'll do the position y plus equals uh, this value. Well, I guess this will be a per second value. So we'll just add that to it. Since the model behavior doesn't access the rec transform directly, which is for the canvas items, let's get that as a, another thing we need to access. So rec transform our transform. And then on start, our transform equals get component rect transform. And then here we will do our transform dot position. Let's see, position dot y plus equals float speed times time dot delta time. Okay, uh, I guess that won't work. So we need to do our transform dot position plus equals and let's do it. And then up here, we'll do a vector three for the float direction equals new vector three, zero, one, zero. So it's floating in the Y vertical direction. Come down here, multiply that by the float speed and the delta time. And we'll see if that makes the text actually raise above where it's at right now. So we hit play and we can see the text floating, but it's pretty slow. Let's make sure it's actually going at 500. Maybe that's a little fast. I'll make it 300. So if we hit play, we can see it floating until it disappears. Lastly, what I think I want to do with the text mesh here is to take the color and to basically have it start fading out um, at a percentage based from where it's at in the time elapsed versus the final time. So text mesh dot, let's see, color is going to be equal to Let's actually get its starting color up here when the script starts. So color starting color. And then we'll do starting color equals text mesh dot color. Uh, this way, when we set the new color, we'll be using the base color and then just changing the alpha. So this is going to be a new color, which is going to be starting color dot R starting color dot. Uh, let's see, G starting color. And then the alpha is going to be one minus time elapsed divided by time to live. So basically we just update the color every time we have an update frame going on. Let's come back here, 
hit play. Okay, try that one more time. Hit play. Okay, so a couple things here. The text mesh pro text element is a UGUI. So I am gonna just assign this in the inspector. So here you can see I'm just dragging this into the slot here. We're gonna get the color and try to change it over time. So here you can actually see uh, now the fading of the text and the raising of the text are all working. So the last thing we need to do is uh, when we take damage, we need to spawn a copy of this health text as a prefab. So let's go into the project. I'm gonna right click here and make a new folder called text. I'll drag this prefab into here. Let's remove it. And now in damageable character, we'll create the reference to that text. So public game object health text. I guess we can call it that. And now we need, just need to drag this in here for the player and the slime prefabs and edit the text so that when uh, we get hit, we actually do something with this, which is going to be to add it to the canvas of the game. So let's see, we get hit over here. So we're going to want to instantiate a copy of this health text. So instantiate health text. This is going to be a text mesh pro GUI. So the text, get it here. Maybe we'll do the namespace here. Uh, might not be the best way to implement it but let's let's give it a shot text mesh pro uh, so when we instantiate it uh it should have a rect transform because we're making a gui element or i could call it text transform so we'll need to cast this from the game object okay maybe we want get component actually dot get component rect transform and then we want to take the transform here text transform dot transform dot position and we want to set it to be right on top of the character that just got damaged uh, but with respect to the camera position so the canvas items kind of sit on a different layer than the actual game objects but we want it to show right above the player so uh, we can get that position uh, using camera dot main dot world to screen point and we take this damageable characters position in order to figure out where that is and we set that to the position here so let's see if that works for us so we hit play and we can see the text being created and it goes away but it's not showing on the canvas so what we can do with the canvas is i'll tag it the canvas so i have the canvas tag here Okay, so we need to get reference to the canvas. So I'm going to do game object dot find objects with tag. I guess we'll do that. And then I'm going to specifically type in canvas. I'll cast this as the canvas and let's do canvas canvas equals canvas. Okay, I guess we actually have to do uh, once again, get component canvas. Now for this to work, you do have to create a tag and then have your canvas actually set to canvas tag. Alternatively, you could do find objects of type. This is probably actually more direct and then you won't have to worry if you accidentally tag it incorrectly. Okay, now that we have the canvas, I need to add the uh, text transform to the canvas. So let's do text transform dot parent or set parent rather to the canvas and if the text is okay maybe we need to do canvas dot transform actually and as long as the canvas actually has the text on it we should hopefully be able to see the text render so let's see if it gets added to this successfully so I hit play the text appears oh it is appearing above and wow just like that it's actually working pretty well and let's hit play we can swing dealing damage to the slimes. And that is pretty much exactly what I was looking for. Seems to be a little bug where those aren't being turned off after they have uh, been destroyed. But aside from that, um, everything seems to be good. So to stop the slime from moving after it's been destroyed, I will check this targetable property in the damageable character um, component. So let's open up this and make sure that we have reference to that. We'll get that at the start of the script. And if 
damageable character dot dot targetable and this then we'll do the movement otherwise otherwise we're just going to not have it move targetable there also going to make these private variables since we're accessing the properties not the variables directly okay so now that we're checking if it's targetable let's see what happens when the slimes take their damage they no longer are moving towards the player so working just like before so I think the last thing I'm going to add to this little crash course is going to be a cooldown whenever a character is hit between when it's hit and the next time it's allowed to be hit. So kind of a invincibility period, if, so to speak. So if we add this into damageable character as a float, I'll call it invincibility time equals... 0.2f. I'll default this to 0.25 seconds. So that means that for that period of time, the character cannot be hit. Um, in addition, we can have a variable, public boolean, so to call it, is invincibility time enabled. I will make that, um, let's say false by default, because maybe you don't actually want uh, slime enemies or other types of enemies to have this but we'll keep it there as an option. Then we'll add one more property to I damageable. So if we jump into this, it's going to be public pool invincible set get. So we're going to need to implement it now. So down here, public pool invincible by default, that's going to be false. For the getter, let's return underscore invincible. And for the set function, we'll do underscore invincible equals value if invincible is true, then we're going to start a timer. So uh, underscore invincible equals true. So let's create a, another variable for the timer. Private float invincible time elapsed equals 0f. So when we set invincible to true, we set the time elapsed to zero. Okay. And then down here at the bottom, public void fixed update. If invincible is true, what we're going to do is we're going to take the invincible time elapsed plus equals times dot delta time. And if invincible time elapsed is greater than invincibility time, then invincible is going to be equal to then invincible is going to be equal to false. Okay, now on hit, uh, what we're going to do is if invincibility is true, if invincible, so if not invincible, actually, it's if the character is not invincible, we'll apply the damage. Otherwise, we're just going to ignore whatever force and attack comes in. So here, if not invincible, then we'll take the damage. But we do also want to check if uh, invincibility is enabled. I could just rename this actually. Is invincible enabled? Okay, so we'll come down here and we want to check if invincible is enabled. But so if invincible is not enabled or the character is not currently invincible, those will be our requirements down there. And then if in is invincible enabled then we're going to activate invincibility and timer so do invincible equals true and i will copy that down here as well okay so let's come out to the game we can see that invincibility is not enabled here for the slime uh, but it does have an invincibility time set there to do the default but for player we can see invincibility is not enabled, but we do want that to be enabled as a option. And maybe I'll rename that again. I think I want it to be called can churn invincible. Can churn invincible. But whatever name works for you. Now we'll hit play and let's see how often can I take damage. So didn't seem to help at all. So let's remove this bit here. It's actually a little bit extra. Because if it can't churn invincible, then we would think it's already not invincible. Um, so if the character can churn invincible, we'll set invincible to true. 
and that's going to last until this fixed update timer returns invincible to false. So let's try one more time. I'll just do a little debug log here to make sure it's going. It's a little hard to tell. So just debug logging the value of invincible at any given time. So let's see. Doesn't say anything. So that means it's probably not being set at all. Ah, so as you can see, the variable isn't set here for the player. But now it now it is. Now it's going. Yeah, I kind of looked there. Uh, I'll increase the time. That'll definitely make it clear. Yes, you can see that for that one period, one second period, you can't take damage. So I'll make it something like uh, 0 0.3 seconds. Let's remove uh, the debug log here. Hit play. Test it a bit more. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So this is the end result of the crash course. As you can see, we have slimes that will follow the player. They can also damage each other, which is pretty cool with the knockbacks. We have a sword swing that does a knockback death animation for the slimes as well. And a player that can take damage. Note the floating damage numbers above the head. So here's our second damage and the player can die, of course, on the third hit. So let's show one more cool thing, which is that not only can the slimes bump into the other slimes, but if you swing a sword into a slime, then it will do double damage because the sword damages the slime. You get the knockback, the slime hits the other slime. It's kind of a combo move. So this is basically the end result of this video, going through the steps, setting up enemies, characters, animating them, and setting up all the physics so that you can get knockback, character attacks, and simple AI in following the player around the screen. So I've been Chris. Thanks for watching all the way to the end of this course video. Hopefully this gives all of you a pretty good idea of how to implement a action RPG for yourself. At this point, I would work on developing some new enemies, making them a little bit more varied in their approach and maybe adding some other elements to the game like treasure chests or NPCs you can talk to. But that's pretty much going to be it for me. I've been Chris. Thanks for watching. If you want to see more content on game development or Unity, please subscribe to the channel and I will see all of you in my future video content.